So welcome to my talk, QGIS Feature Frenzy. Uh, my name is Kurt Menke, and I work for Septima. We're uh, an open source geospatial firm located in Copenhagen, Denmark. And as a daily user of QGIS, um, author of QGIS books, teacher of QGIS courses, I'm always following the new developments in QGIS. So I'm happy to share some of the developments that have uh, happened in the last year. So let's start with the roadmap to better understand the, the different versions that we're dealing with in QGIS. So every year in February or March, there's a version coined a long-term release, which for a calendar year then receives no new features. It's stable in that aspect, but just receives bug fixes. So uh, then every four months, we get a new stable release. So in the last year, we um, went from long-term release 328 to 334 with all the intermediate stable releases. And since 334, we've had 336 and 338 Grenoble, which was just released last week. So I'm gonna begin by covering features that you'll find in this new long-term release 334. So features in the last year. And <clears throat> so there's three stable releases included in these uh, features, and this is a list of all the new features produced in each of these releases. I obviously can't go through all those in 20 minutes, so um, we're going to just pick kind of the most significant changes and some that may be overlooked and convenient. So I'm going to start with some, um, go by categories. So we'll cover some in the user experience category, some relating to print layouts, form fields and widgets. There's a new major feature called uh, raster attribute tables, and then some point cloud processing tools that I'll talk about. For each slide, I'll have a kind of an animated GIF that demonstrates that feature as I describe it, and there's gonna be a little QGIS banner in the upper right that'll indicate which version of QGIS that feature was released for us for your reference. So let's start with uh, what I call quality of life improvements. We're going to cover some changes to the user profile selector and some new layer ordering improvements. So just for a review, the user profiles, you can access those via settings user profiles. And these profiles uh, store the plugins that you have installed, toolbars and panels that you have enabled, the language that the GUI is in, layer styles that are available and things like that. And so people create them for different projects, for different workflows, and maybe different customers. So you can now go into settings options and go to the user profiles tab, and you can choose the behavior for which um, profiles start within QGIS. So historically, the behavior was that you would get um, the last profile that you had open when you closed QGIS would be the one that opened with. But you can now have the option to choose the behavior of choose the user profile at startup. And you can choose a little icon for that profile. And if you choose that option, when you launch QGIS, you get this little window that lets you choose the user profile that you want to open QGIS with. So this is super handy if you are like me and have a lot of different profiles that you may want to uh, use on a daily basis. There's also been layer ordering improvements. So in settings, canvas, and legend, you'll find these. And previously, when you added a new layer to QGIS, it would land in the layers panel above the currently selected layer, which wasn't always the most ideal place. So there's now an option to always put that new layer on the top of the layer tree. And even nicer, I think, an optimal index within the layer tree group. And so this will order points on top of lines, on top of polygons. So to see how this works, we can look at 328, and I add seven layers to QGIS, and they get added alphabetically, kind of with mixed geometries. Whoops, sorry about that. So again, adding seven new layers to the previous long-term release, 328, they get uh, added alphabetically. But now in 334, with that option checked, I add the same number of layers, and they get ordered by um, geometry. Uh, 
under identify tool, um, there's been some nice enhancements, especially relating to rasters. So there's now, it's possible to get results on hover with no click. You can show the, the see the raster column and row in the derived features section of identify results, and the pixel will be highlighted where you clicked. So here I have a digital surface model of this Trelleborg uh, Viking ring fort in Denmark. And if I use the identify tool, I can put it in that mode to mouse over. And now as I hover over this, I'm getting the results live as my cursor floats over this DSM. So that's super handy for um, working with rasters especially. And it will also, do, using that same map, um, highlight the pixel and in the derived features shows the column and row that I clicked on. So that can be some, some useful information if you're investigating some data. Um, and you'll see there, this is a fairly small resolution DEM. So if I zoom into it a little bit and use the identify tool again, you'll see how that behavior works with that one pixel being highlighted. Just like it works with uh, vector data. There's also a nice new feature. Um, QGIS now supports loading layers in parallel threads. And so this significantly reduces the load time for projects with a lot of layers, especially if those um, are remote layers. There's also now a download vector tiles algorithm in QGIS that you can use to create a local copy of, that, um, of those vector tiles. Moving into print layouts, there's now a shortcut manager in the print composer. You're seeing a screenshot of that here. There's support for elevation profile plots within the print composer. And hyperlink support for PDF output. So here if I'm in the print composer, I can go to the, uh, the settings, keyboard shortcuts, and I have a list of all the actions in the print composer and I can set up my own custom keyboard shortcuts for any one of them. So I'm using control M for add map. Now I can just hit control M on my keyboard and I automatically have that tool activated and I can add my map to the layout. I can do the same for any of those actions. It is, there's now a, an add elevation profile plot also available in the print composer. So when you load this and, and, and uh, select it, you can choose an existing profile plot in your project and it'll uh, adopt those configuration settings for that profile plot. And the last nice feature for I'll talk about for um, print compositions is hyperlink support for PDF output. So if you add some text to QGIS and you um, render it as HTML, and you have a nice um, HTML string for that hyperlink. When you export that out to PDF, that link stays active in the PDF. So that's a nice new feature. Moving into field forms and widgets, there's now audiovisual and multimedia attribute attachment support in addition to photos. So now if I use identify results on one of these wolf points, I see the values for that point, and if I put this in into form view, I will see the photograph, but I'll also see the, the video recording associated with this, and I can play the audio recording as well. We also have um, spacer widgets, and this support for current value support for text and HTML widgets. So here's a spacer widget. This is just a, a, a way to organize your field form and make it easy to read. And here I'm bringing up the uh, configuration for a text widget. And I'm gonna use an expression where I'm gonna take the current value for population and divide it by the current value for area. And I'm gonna call this density. So it's gonna be just a text widget that's gonna on the fly calculate the density based on the current value of those two existing fields. So I'll click OK, and then I'm going to go back to my map. I'm going to put this layer into edit mode, and I'm going to add a point. So the field form will come up, 
and I can type in a population value and an area value, and you can see that density text widget below automatically populating with the results of those uh, fields that I just entered. So there's a lot of use cases for that. The next major feature that I'm really excited about is native support for raster attribute tables. So previously, this had been um, in the form of a plugin. It's now integrated into the core of QGIS. So this in, allows you to do automatic raster styling based on the raster attribute table. There's change classification, so you can choose, you can classify the raster based on a different field. Identify results works with this, and you could use the mouse over as well. Uh, there's in layer properties, an attribute tab for the attribute table for rasters, and you can edit these tables and create one from a current classification if one doesn't exist. There's a lot of functions re related to this now. So if I just add a vegetation uh, raster to QGIS that has an attribute table, it comes in pre-styled based on the styling in that raster attribute table. If I right click on it, I can open up that attribute table and it looks just like a vector attribute table, but it has a color map on the right hand side that um, the symbology is based on. So I can also open up that raster attribute table and I can change the field that the classification is based on. In other words, change the field that it's being styled against. So here I'm going to change it from vegetation type to vegetation class and click OK. And now I'm going to get a different map based on the class of vegetation versus existing vegetation type. So as I mentioned, this also works with identify. So I can use the identify features on this raster and I'll see the results just like I would with a vector data set. And if I right click on this layer and open up layer properties, you'll find now that there is an attribute table tab in layer properties for raster layers and that will show the raster attribute table. You'll notice at the top there's uh, some editing functionality, you can put this into edit mode, add fields, drop fields, just like you would with a vector attribute table. So super nice, I'm very excited about this one. Moving on to point clouds. So at QGIS 332, there was a lot of functionality added around uh, point clouds, including native QGIS processing algorithms. There's something like 17 different processing algorithms in QGIS for point clouds now, divided into point cloud conversion, point cloud data management, and point cloud extraction. And I'll show a couple of these that I've highlighted here. So here, in, for downtown Copenhagen, I have a series of uh, nine different point cloud tiles, and I'm going to zoom into a particular neighborhood open up the processing toolbox, and I'm going to use this merge point cloud tool. So I'm going to select all those. I can then also uh, tell it I want it to merge them just for the selected extent. And Q just finishes, and I now have this new merged point cloud clipped to the current extent. It's being indexed right now, so it just shows the footprint. But in a second, it brings up the classification for that. There's also a filtering point cloud algorithm, which is super nice. So here you can filter based on attributes. So here's an example of filtering one by, for vegetation, low, medium, and high, um, based on the classification attributes. Here's another example where I'm just going to extract the buildings. So I'm classification equals just the buildings. And that results in just the buildings from that point cloud layer um, as a, a, a new point cloud. Just to expand on this workflow, I can now go into the converting toolbox and I can convert this building's point cloud to a raster. So in this toolbox, there are tools for converting the format, converting to vector, and converting to raster. So I'm going to open up the export to raster tool. And in this tool, you can select the point cloud, 
You can choose the attribute. Here I'm going to use the Z attribute for elevation. You can set the output resolution of the raster. Click Run. And now I'm going to get a digital surface model of these buildings based on that point cloud. And so I can then do whatever I want to it, like use the hillshade renderer on those buildings. And there's also a virtual point clouds tool. Um, so this is a similar concept to virtual rasters. And I should say this is actually a new data provider, virtual point clouds. So a similar concept is virtual rasters. So as we know, point cloud tiles can be um, large, and we usually have to work with quite a few to cover a study area. So virtual point clouds allow you to essentially merge a set of tiled point cloud files into a single layer while you're only creating a small JSON file. So it's a JSON file with a VPC extension, and it references a set of point cloud files such as LAZ, LAS, um, cloud optimized point cloud. And you can then run processing tools on that VPC, reproject, clip, etc. And it can be viewed in a 3D environment. So this is a, a nice new data provider. So that was a run through the new long term release and what you'll find in that. And I'm going to spend the last couple of minutes um, covering a couple of notable features in 336 Maidenhead released earlier this spring and QGIS 3.3.8 Grenoble, which was just released last week. So in 3.3.6 Maidenhead, there's now a filled line symbol layer type. So this is a, a, a basically a, a symbol layer type. So I can have a line layer and choose filled line, and I get basically a similar set of options that I would get with a, a polygon layer. So I can fill this um, line with different polygon styles. I can choose the, the width and things like that. Another really nice point cloud feature that came out at 336 is the ability to render point clouds as a surface. So here I'm looking at that same downtown Copenhagen point cloud. And if I toggle off render as a surface, um, I'll see that there's a, a small gap there. I toggle it back on. and QGIS interpolates the point cloud, filling in those gaps. Switching to 338 Grenoble, just released last week. This is, a, I think, a pretty major feature. There's now CMYK color support in QGIS. So now you can choose the color mode that you want to work with, RGB or CMYK. So you can you have CMYK, CMYK colors you need to work with, you can enter them directly into the, the color tool in QGIS. Another really major feature in 338 is elevation filtering. So here's that same Viking ring fort in uh, Denmark, and I'm going to go to the view menu and for data filtering, turn on the elevation filtering, and it puts this widget onto the map canvas between the minimum and maximum values in my DEM, and I can use these sliders to filter what I'm seeing. So I can filter out just for the elevation range that composes this ring fort in this example. You can move the sliders from the top or the bottom, and you can even slide it, keeping that same minimum and maximum range. So this is a super nice feature. And the last thing I'll talk about involves mesh data. So with mesh data, for vector styling, there's now a new um, style you can use, wind barbs. So this might be hard to see, so I blew it up. So you can style your vectors with wind barbs, so they'll get basically more tails on that barb with, in this case, higher magnitude wind. So um, yeah. More and more options for styling mesh data as well. So that was a whirlwind tour of some of the, the biggest features with uh, QGIS over the last year. And uh, if we have time for questions, I can, I'm happy to take those. Thank you, Kurt. That was really amazing, all these new uh, cool features and well presented.
It's time for questions. Any questions from the audience? No questions, then I'll start with one uh, question here. So uh, this uh, vertical controller is a nice, uh, cool feature. Um, can you use that also on other uh, raster types than elevation? Are, are there use cases for that you can think of? Yeah, I mean, I think you can use it. I think I saw an example of using it with mesh data the other day, didn't I? From you? <laughs> 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 yeah, so I, I think the answer is yes. I haven't played around with it much, okay. to be honest. And I saw Saber uh, yesterday using it in combination also with the temporal controller. So yes. th that was also really nice to see that you can, for a hurricane, um, select uh, a range uh, of, of uh, elevation that you look at the, the layer and an, a range of uh, time. And it's yes. a really cool combination of features. Exactly, yeah. So there are a lot of possibilities there. Questions? Yes. Are you are you seeing more update uptake on the Conda distribution of QGIS over the installers, or is it still primarily people relying on the installers over Conda? Yeah, I mean, I th the, the Conda installer has been um, working quite well for several years now, so um, and it's being maintained. So that's a great option for anyone. As in addition to Osgeo for Windows and, and other, all the other installers and all the other platforms. I've seen quite some uh, uptake on that, uh, especially for uh, people who want to have separate environments with different versions of QGIS, and also the platform independability it works nice. Yeah. It's time for one more question. No one? Okay, then uh, ask again for applause for, uh, for Kurt before we move to the next one. Thank you.